Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we return to our study in the book of Judges, should we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his blessing so that we may indeed learn that which he would have us to know for this time in our history and this time in Earth's history? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before thee because we need your guidance. We need your wisdom. As we read in this song, we need to understand that which you would show us for this time, for our time now. Father, we thank you for the various lessons that you're showing us and teaching us. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to join together, to be guided, to be directed. We need you. We need your spirit. We need your angels so that our minds may be fixed on that which we are to study. Help us now to understand that which we are seeing. Guide us so that we might understand and place this in the perspective that we need for the message that you want given to this world. I thank you for each one that are attending this study. Help us and guide us now so that we may see that which you would teach us, that our eyes will be open and our hearts will be ready to receive. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Yesterday, we left off as we were addressing Judges 5.11. There are points that we began addressing that we need to return to so that we can proceed through the balance of this book. Because did not Father Miller tell us, we should consider each verse and not proceed until we have an understanding of that verse. Is that not one of his rules? Well, that's, yeah, that's the way that he approached studying Though he did look at other verses to, to understand that. He wasn't just like reading the verse and trying to understand it on its own. Understood. He wanted to understand the things he was reading before he, he moved on. Okay. Now, as we see this, there are several added words by the translators in this verse. We are seeing they that are delivered was added and toward the inhabitants is also added. So as the verse reads, they that are delivered from the noise of archers in the place of drawing water, there shall they rehearse the righteous acts or the righteousness of the Lord even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of his villages in Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. And I believe you were addressing that there's, there's some items in this verse in the Hebrew that need to be approached a bit differently. How should we do that? Well, okay. So, so when we look at this verse, um, you know, you could compare what I usually use is my uh, King James concordance. So, you know, they talk about the noise of the archer. Well, that would, if you compare it to other places, it would be usually the voice of the archer. I mean, it can refer to noise. Um, like when you're talking about the noise of the trumpet, okay. but that's, we're translating it into English because we wouldn't talk 
generally about the voice of the trumpet, right? Or we might use the sound of the trumpet, right? Because uh, a voice we usually think is being like a human. Um, so, or, you know, the noise of a tall tumult or something like that, you know, that would make sort of sense. But here, this would be the voice of the archers. And, and then, um, so exactly what these archers, but in the places of the drawing water or the wells. So why would you have archers in these, these wells, the places of, of drawing water? So, so there's some things that just don't quite make sense if, and that's why you'll see like extremely different translations of this verse by almost every translation has some different take on it. Um, but they're also not being delivered from the noise of the archers or the voice of the archers in the places of the wells. So we can look at the wells as something where you draw um, living water from, right? So this water would represent uh, the Holy Spirit. And then we have this rehearsing um, that uh, of the righteous act. So we would have to have this as basically drawing things as line upon line. Because remember, um, we have a line that's judgment and, and then the plummet is righteousness in Isaiah 28. Okay. Right. So in Isaiah 28, where it talks about uh, precept upon precept, line upon line in that chapter, um, then you're going to have uh, judgment will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. So that's the same word uh, that you have there in Judges as far as righteousness. And here they have it as righteous acts. But, but if we think about rehearsing, uh, that is, we're going to, um, you know, state again something that's happened, and it comes from a word which means to recount, rehearse, or tell again is the word, um, and usually in something that is attributing honor. So, so this would be the line upon line approach, and from the voice of the archers in the places of drawing water they shall rehearse the righteous acts or these way marks, right? Because those would be the way marks of the, on the line of the Lord, even the righteous acts. So it repeats this. So wouldn't this be the midnight cry way mark? It very much could be. Yeah. And then towards not the inhabitants of the villages, but towards the leaders in Israel, right? The rulers in Israel is what it's referring to. So then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. And it was just. Um, so there was here in this descending um, to the gates and gates. I mean, it's mostly what it, it means, but. Um, but it can mean different things. And, and when I was looking at it in, because uh, it comes from the word sha'ar, which means to estimate. All right. So, so I'm not sure what that means. It's just that I don't really think the sentence makes sense. Different people try to make it make sense um, in these different translations. Like, you know, some translations are, you know, even those who carry water to the animals will tell you the Lord has won victories and so has Israel. Then God's people march down to the town gates. That's one translation. Um, and then another one uh, says, because the voice of those who divide the spoil in the midst of the places of drawing water. 
So they're using this word of archers to, in a sense, to divide. And, and they're talking about the spoil. Um, another one says, where the chariots were dashed together and the army of the enemies was choked, let there be the justices of the Lord be rehearsed and his clemency towards the brave men of Israel. Right, so you can see that there's some very different ways in which this is translated. That, that you would hardly even recognize the, the verse unless, you know, you, you, you know, somebody pointed it out. So I'm not really sure what to do about that, other than to just take the words as they are literally. Well, I was looking at, at your initial point. Okay. Because as we're, as we're looking at the first part of this verse, they that are delivered from the noise of archers in the places of drawing water. There are multiple verses that address the noise of something. Mm -hmm. Whether we're dealing with the noise of war in the camp, as Joshua pointed out to Moses, or we're dealing with the noise from the fish gate in Zephaniah. In Zephaniah. Okay. The noise that's being referenced can be a type of a cry. It can be a lot of references, but here the application could very logically be made, as you're saying, that this could be as the midnight cry. Mm -hmm. And there's also, because you don't see this really in the King James, is this word uh, that's translated as between in some of the other translations, right? Okay. So in the King James, um, where they have um, uh, the word in, the places of drawing water, okay. this actually means... Uh, well, it can mean, but it usually means like between, right? All right. So we would have the, the noise of the archers between the places of drawing water. Yeah. Now, and then the way that this is, I'll get a look at this on this other site. So... Staying in a sec. <clears throat> um, yeah, so like in the Hebrew, you have um, uh, Mikol, so that's. Um, from the voices of, um, and then they have this this other word too. So um, divide between. So there's another word, which uh, how do they do this in the King James? So it's almost like they just ignore it. Okay, so so they translated as archers, but this would mean divide between, right? So archers, which they have as archers, really means to divide, right? It, it can mean archers, to, that is to shoot arrows, but it's a different form of the word. Um, it's a, like in a different... Uh, uh, verbal form. So, um, so it doesn't really make sense to translate it as archers at all. How so, would you look at it? Well, it's this voice that 
divides between the places of drawing water, between the wells. So this would be like a loud cry, talking about two different ways of understanding truth. There they shall rehearse the righteous acts, right? So this is the way that we're going to divide truth from error, maybe is another way of looking at it. We put line upon line, we put the way marks of the Lord, even the righteous acts, so we have it doubled, uh, towards the leaders in Israel. Well, it wouldn't be of his leaders in Israel, so that doesn't have toward the inhabitants. It's of his leaders in Israel, not villages. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. And then we'd have to figure out what this gate is referring to. But that would make more sense in the context of what we're, we're, we're seeing as far as the movement. If, excuse me. If we were to look at the gates as being a place of judgment. Yeah. Would that fit with what we're looking at here? Yeah. Now, there was a comment in the chat. I don't, you know, I, I recognize that symbols can have more than one meaning. And we made in the past that Methuselah has been a more of a symbol, really, of, of the second angel's message, correct? Yeah. Well, yeah, but also Methuselah is not man of the dark, no matter what anybody says. Okay. Because it means when he dies, it shall come. Okay. Now, as we as we go back over this to prepare to go to the next verse, they that are delivered from the cry between the places of, of drawing water. Yeah, but there's no sense of being delivered, right? This is just the, the voice of, the voice that divides between the places of drawing water. Okay. Which would be the loud cry. But wouldn't, wouldn't the loud cry deliver some yeah, but this isn't talking about deliverance. Okay. This is talking about a voice that causes a division. Okay. There's a voice that 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 divides between the places of drawing water. Is how I would translate translate it. Okay. So if there is a voice that divides between the places of drawing water, is this a an apt description of the movement? Yeah. And that, and that voice is this rehearsing of the righteous acts, the way marks drawn on the line. Right. And since, you know, we would also remove this, this other added portion, that these righteous acts would be rehearsed toward the leadership. Would that be correct? Well, it's the righteous acts of those who are the leaders in Israel. Okay. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the place of judgment. So if we're making this application regarding the midnight cry, does that help this verse become more meaningful for us today? Well, it makes more sense.
How does some of the rest of you feel from our from this conversation? I mean, the whole point, the whole point of this is for us to join in and talk about these things. Yeah, so you're saying that the righteous acts are mainly of, of the judges, right? Of the leaders. That's, that's what's put on the line. It's reversing these righteous acts of the leaders in Israel. Well, it makes sense. Then the next step is like, then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates for judgment. <clears throat> and gates can be a door as well. I mean, it's just you can refer to the door. So, would that be a door like what we've seen in the parable of the ten virgins? Yeah, the closed door. Well, if they're going down to the door for a while it is open and then it becomes closed right it'll close yeah okay still but um and this makes more sense to me um just in the context of reading the whole chapter as well because in a sense that's what she's doing is is rehearsing the righteous acts of the leaders in israel She's basically telling what you what she's doing, but we make it as an application to not just talking about it, but this actually is drawing these on a line and understanding them. Okay. And then you have the contrast between the, the leaders in verse seven, the ones that ceased right um until deborah arose and so now the same the same symbol of leaders uh we're going to look at their righteous acts okay <clears throat> so we would apply this on the the inhabitants of the villages as being the leaders within the movement or the leaders within the church. Well, this is talking about the movement. We're not ever okay. looking. This is dealing with the church. Okay. See, the application we're making is this movement. Okay. So the leaders of the movement ceased. They ceased in Israel. Until that I, Deborah, arose, and I arose a mother in Israel. Right. So this is talking about what happened in this movement. Right? Okay. Now, I mean, yeah, if you're... Because the context here is this movement in the context of Adventism. I mean, so you could apply it to the leaders in Adventism. But I don't think that that's primarily what we're looking at. Okay. At least in my view, we're looking at um, that there's this message, and this message in the movement is repressed, right? So, because in this movement we're dealing with Parminder, so these leaders would be people like Parminder, Mark Bruce, um, the other groups that left the movement, right? Right. And I think that would make much more sense than trying to apply this to the church. Because didn't these people cease? They've ceased to have effect, yes. They've ce their voice has ceased. Yeah, they, they have no part in the movement anymore. They've gone off on their own direction. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when we, we take a look, and I'll, I'll use, use this example, you look at the situation with Emiliano right now, in mm -hmm. the fact that he has chosen to fully reject anything having to do with Ellen White. Yeah, so he's chosen new, new gods. Right.
So he rejects Ellen White altogether? Yes. I've got, mm. I, I actually have a, an email that he sent out to various people about why Ellen White should be rejected and his decision that he sees as being freedom to him. Wow. That's, it's, it, it is a sad letter, especially given that many of the sources that he chooses to use as experts are those that were also within the Adventist church and chose to reject Ellen White. Went from light to go right into darkness. Exactly. Wow. Now, one of, the, one of the points that had come up and was, was addressed with some was that he was having his battles with many of the things that Mrs. White had written, even at the time that he came to Future for America to address Ezra 7, verse 9. So the Lord used him to help us come to an understanding of this passage, but he was making his decisions at that time as to whether or not he was going to continue because there were certain things in his life at that time that, that he wanted and he wanted to accept whether or not Mrs. White's writings would agree with his decision. Yeah. Well, when people choose new gods, it's because they've rejected God because of the restraint they imagine that God puts upon us, which is really just the restraint of sin. Now, just another point dealing with the gates, because in verse 8, they chose new gods. Then was war in the gates. Was there a shield or spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? So we're going to address the gates later on. Then shall the right. people of the Lord go down to the gates. And so this is a place of battle as well. I could agree with that. And and so this battle um, is is the Lord's, right? Because we don't have shield or spear, but we have we have God. So we're fighting the enemy not with earthly weapons, but with spiritual weapons. But isn't the 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 battle that we face each day? a battle of our character. Mm -hmm. So they chose new gods. Then was war in the gates. So the war in the gates is, is that a, a spiritual reference to our the, the need that we have each of character development. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as that continued, of course, then Deborah would be looking that her heart would be toward the governors of Israel, those that would have a victory either having achieved or coming in the battle in their character that have then offered themselves willingly among the people to say hey this is the way walk ye in it how do we view them Well, so here where we have, um, it says, then was war in the gates. And, right. and the King James there is kind of weak because, you know, it's just they're not really translating the word then, I think, in the best best way. But the idea is um, 
at that time was war in the gates, which I think just makes it more clear. They chose new gods. At that time was war in the gates. It's, it's, um, uh, how do you put, how do you explain that? It's showing that this is, there is this battle going on that has to do with a choice. So you got ones who are choosing new gods. That is, they're finding new leaders. They want to, instead of God delivering them in this battle. They, they're looking to the gods of the other nations. And then this question, which was their shield or spear seen among 40,000 in Israel. We still haven't understood what the 40,000 is, what it's symbolizing. And, and the other thing is um, that word uh, at that time is a demonstrative. That's why Young's literal translation uh, uses, then war at, is at the gates with an exclamation mark. Okay. So, so we have to figure out what this this battle with this forty thousand is. I mean, we're slowly piecing this together, but it's it's. Uh, um, I mean, I think we're starting to see what it is. <coughs> Okay. Yeah, I, you know, one of the points that Stephen brought up yesterday, when we look at that with the 40,000, if we divide the 40,000 by the number of prophetic days in a prophetic year, mm -hmm. we come up with 111.111 to infinity. Yeah. Okay, so that's the one way we looked at the 40,000. Um, we also have um, in uh, Joshua chapter 4, and this might be what they're actually referencing. Um, so uh, let me see. So this is when they cross over Jordan. And... Uh, and so start at 411, it came to pass when all the people have completed to pass over, that the ark of Jehovah passeth over, and the priests in the presence of the people, and the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, pass over by fifties before the sons of Israel, as Moses had spoken unto them. About 40,000 armed ones of the host passed over before Jehovah for battle onto the plains of Jericho. So I think that's what they're referencing in Judges chapter four, 5 there. Does that make sense? And I was reading it from Young's literal translation, by the way. Okay. <clears throat> Cover that again, please. Okay. okay, I'll do it. I'll do it from the King James this time. Um. So it came to pass when the people were clean passed over, that the ark of the Lord passed over, and the priests in the presence of the people. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the children of Israel, as Moses spake unto them. About 40,000 prepared for war passed over before the Lord unto battle to the plains of Jericho. So are we looking then at this at the 40,000 being those that are prepared for battle? And is Deborah then saying that they're of these 40,000 that they're no longer prepared for battle at this time? Well, they didn't have shield or spear, right? How did they defeat Jericho? They had their reliance upon God. Right. So so that's what I think she says when 
was there a shield or a spear seen among the 40 among 40,000 in Israel I think this is referring to the battle of Jericho in in the sense that we have these 40,000 men um that they go before them and So it's it's just referencing us back to that imagery because that to me seems to be what the primary reference must be. Okay. <clears throat> so as as we're dealing with this portion, we're seeing that they chose new gods statement then there was war in the gates but we know that this is not a literal war it is a spiritual war yeah so there are those that are spiritually in warfare against god mm -hmm. and there are those that are spiritually in warfare as god is leading yeah interesting because I mean, we all have this battle to fight <clears throat> right some are going to choose new gods but there's others that are going to choose god and they don't have a shield or a spear that is they're not fighting you know flesh and blood they're fighting these spiritual powers, which is the battle of self, right? Right. So who's going to be our ruler, God or, or self? And um, so verse 9 then, my heart is toward the, the governors of Israel or the leaders of Israel that offer themselves willingly among the people, bless ye the Lord. Speak ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit in judgment and walk by the way. Um, by the voice that divides between the places of drawing water, there rehearse the righteous acts, which are the way marks, even the righteous acts of the leaders in Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. So there we're going to go down to this battle prepared with these lines right and and thinking about the righteous acts i mean we have and we've looked at this we've looked at miller we looked at his line we looked at moses's line we looked at jeff's line you know these are the things that we have to rehearse or set on a line these are the things that are going to help us in this battle I know it seems kind of odd that, you know, drawing things on a line and putting dates and going through the stories of the Bible and through our own history um, is what God is asking us to do. But that's what he's been asking us to do. And this has been um, a blessing to all that have been doing it. Well, if we don't if, if we don't place these items on a line. If we're not willing to study line upon line, then how are we ever going to be able to understand what God is trying to say to us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is just the tool that God has given us to sort through these stories, to sort, sort through our history. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> the next verse, awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, utter a song, arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Abinoam. So all these doublings. Right. Yeah. Now, is the song... Uh, it, is this verse saying that the song is to be uttered by Deborah 
or it's to be uttered by Barack. Mm. Or is this a song that's being said that jointly they should be giving the song? That's the, that's the three ways I'm looking at this. <clears throat> Deborah is being told in a pair of doublings to awake. Then it is utter a song, arise. So if we are to utter a song, are we not to be recounting God's mercy in how he has led us? I mean, what, what other spiritual ways could we look at this? And then you have the admonition to Barak and lead thy captivity captive. First Corinthians, uh, something or other. He led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Can't remember where that is. Okay. Yeah, so, so this uh, awake, awake is in the imperative form. And um, awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake. Okay, so it's in the imperative. How, how do you see this? Um, well, that's just the form that it's in. That means... It's, it's like a command. Okay, so what you were re referencing earlier, was that Ephesians 4, verse 8? Is it Ephesians 4? I thought it was, okay. Um, okay, let me take a look here. Oh, yeah, it's Ephesians 4, 8. That's where it is. Yeah. Wherefore he saith, he ascended up on high, he led cap ki captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And that's uh, in Psalm 18, uh, 68, verse 18, that they're quoting. Thou so. hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. <clears throat> How should we how should we further look at this? Okay, so this is interesting. Um, so just looking at this verse, it's um, so this thing here. So when you look at this, you can't see it in English. You have to see it in in Hebrew. So the name Deborah, which means a bee, right? Okay. But if you take the word, um, the way that it's actually pronounced in Hebrew, if you look at the word utter, it's the word dabar, which means um, uh, to speak, right? It's a command, etc. But actually in the Hebrew, because of the form that it's in, it it's uh, pronounced as... Um, Deborah. Okay. So it's a pun. 
Okay. So, so awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, Deborah, uh, uh, Shair, right? So that's um, sing. So even though it says uh, utter a song, the implication is it's Deborah. That right because you you got basically the same uh, pronounce pronunciation Deborah. I, I just said you know so they're so they're making a pun on on her name in to say utter a song. And then it does, and then when it does uh, this, uh, so arise, right? Uh, Com, abrak, uh, and then he's going to lead captivity captive. So it's captivity and the captive. So that's. <clears throat> So the song, the song is the song of Deborah telling Barak to lead captivity captive. This is my conclusion. Spiritually, how do we lead captivity captive? Well, uh, to lead the captives out of captivity is the idea. Right, but but it is a doubling, so it is the midnight cry, the delivering of those that are in captivity. So you're capturing captivity. So that's so. Um, Okay. <clears throat> so as as we go through this, you we, you're pointing out that there is a pun here yeah. in Judges five twelve. Mm -hmm. Which double, a doubling pun? Well, that's it. Kind of is a doubling. A pun is a doubling. Yes. Okay. But the, but the idea here of of a pun is it draws your attention to something as prophetically significant as a symbol. Okay. That's why they use puns in Hebrew. It's not, not as a sense of humor, but as uh, it's a rhetorical device, especially in prophecy. But you see puns throughout, throughout the Bible. So we're going we're going to take a look at this as a prophetic utterance. Mm -hmm. Okay, another comment from the chat. Awake, awake is also in Isaiah fifty one nine and verse seventeen and fifty two one. What do we see there? From well, 52, it says about putting on uh, beautiful garments, put on strength, O Jerusalem. For henceforth shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. So it has like a, to me, that speaks about the church triumphant. Right. It's established and um, there's not going to be any more sinners coming in. Whoever's going to come into the church is going to be keeping the Sabbath. I, I put this here time. After, after the Sunday law has come into effect, the church has been purified. <laughs> and then you have that statement in verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. So this is a message 
of uh, that's going out. It's not to close the profession, but so that, that's where I would put the 53 verse 1. So maybe the loud cry there aspect to that. And then in verse 17 of the previous chapter, we have as awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou has drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling and run and run them out. So um, I think with the Sunday law crisis, it's a purifying aspect to it. Uh, you can maybe apply that. And then uh, verse 9, Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in generations of old. Art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? So I haven't really thought too much about that, but um, has quite a similar aspect to, uh, to verse 52. Chapter 52, verse 1 says, put on thy strength as well. So are all of these combined with what we're seeing here in Judges 5? A parallel reference to the parable of the ten virgins. where we're being told to awake, to pay attention to the message. I think that would be a valid application. Okay. So the 10 virgins, five wise, would waken before the Sunday law. The five foolish would not. And the character development must occur prior to the Sunday law. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that Elder Jeff pointed out many times. Okay. Then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. What kind of a Hebraism are we seeing here? What's important about him that remains? Well, that's the remnant. Okay. Now here, the translators, when they're giving this reference, would take us to Psalm 4914. Like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. Okay, so here's an odd coincidence. Okay. So I was just looking at um, uh, the gematria for Barak. Okay. And was it Barak? No, it wasn't Barak. It was, um, uh, oops, it was Abinoam. Okay. And we have here the normal product. That is, if you take the, the letters of the name in English of Obinoam and you multiply them together, you get the number. Uh, so if you go back to that verse you were just reading. Right. So. The one in Psalms. 
Psalms 49, 14. Right. Uh, the normal product for Obinuim is 49140. Interesting. <laughs> so, so as soon as I seen that, because it was just like a few seconds before, I was just going through uh, Barak, the son of Obinuim, and, uh, and then I saw that 49.14. So that's interesting. It's one-tenth of the normal, normal product of the name Obinuim. Just an interesting coincidence. Okay. So he that remains shall have dominion over the nobles among the people. The remnant will have dominion over the nobles among the people. Yeah, the this here means that the remnant is, or the, the dominion means to tread down. Okay. It doesn't mean to destroy. It just means to tread down. Well, it means to tread down. Yeah. Okay. So how else would you apply this? Well, that just means to win in battle. Generally, you're, you can deal with it. It means to often persecute um, just because of the domination, right? Of one group over another. That's why they have the word dominion in sort of an old sense of the word, not so much in the way that we normally look at it today. Okay. Prevail to rule over, um, have dominion over, and prevail against. Right. Um, so over the nobles. Okay, just keep going. I'm just looking okay. at these words here. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. <clears throat> so, figuratively, Deborah is saying that the Lord has made her to have dominion over the mighty. In a figurative sense, would this mean those that are using Miller's rules and trusting in God will have dominion over those that have seen themselves to be mighty in using methods of study that man has promoted? How else should we how else should we approach this? Well, so they had dominion over the nobles among the people. Right. This would be The word means wide or large, uh, figuratively powerful. Um, so, and then he has the Lord made me to have dominion again over the mighty. So that means that the remnant um, are going to be able to conquer those who on the surface appear to have the power. Okay. So this would be to conquer, as you just said, those that appear at least on the surface to have power, but they don't have true power and the basis of their power begins to crumble. Yeah, because they have the, the praise of the people.
All right. Okay, there's a comment in the chat. Looking at Judges 4, 11 to 13, in combination with Numbers 1, 21, along with 24 and 25, and verse 35, and then Judges 5, 8. And the attempt is made to total that of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, the warriors, crossing the Jordan, and saying... Right, that's Joshua. Sorry, that's Joshua 4. It's my horrible typing again. Okay. I was just curious because you guys had mentioned all these verses, and I thought, well, what if the number of the tribes total in Joshua is a span of time? And I, as I said, I don't know where it begins and where it ends. I'm leading to, leaving it to you experts. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I've already thought about that, so. Um, so that's um, uh, one, two, three, one, two, four, three, five, zero. In number. Right. Yeah, so. All right. Well, I've run into that number before. Okay, so <clears throat> allowing this to continue, we would come to Judges 5.14. <clears throat> Out of Ephraim was there a root of them against Amalek. After thee, Benjamin, among thy people, out of Machir came down governors, and out of Zebulun they that handle the pen of the writer or draw with the pen of the writer. Okay, so this is interesting. Okay. So the writer here is somebody who takes a tally. Okay. The totals. Yeah, totals things, right? Um, and, and this word, mashak, which is translated as handle, um, has a lot of different meanings, um, but it, it means... It can have include uh, different applications like to sow, to sound, to prolong, to develop, to march, to remove, to delay, to be tall. So lots of different things. Um, to draw along or draw out, continue, defer, extend, forbear, give, handle, make, uh, scatter, stretch out. But in the sense of drawing out these um, uh, with the pen, uh, the numbers, right? This enumeration. The pen of the writer is the pen of the enumerator is going to draw out these lines. Make sense? Yeah, it can. Now, now the word translated here as pen um, it, it can also be translated as tribe so <laughs> so isn't that what we're doing what we've been doing is taking these tribes and drawing them out or stretching them out isn't that what we're supposed to do? Yeah, and there it, it, that is the number of these tribes. So the tribe of uh, 
the enumerator uh, or whatever you want to call it this is the numbering of the tribes that they're supposed to draw out and out of zebulun well the first one that we used was odilia odilio using zebulun when he counted from the organization of the adventist church um in may uh well it was may what 23rd uh 1863 right in that date and stretching it to july 18 2020 correct so so i think this is pretty interesting that this verse has these words in it in regard to zebulun And actually, it can even just plainly be said to stretch out Zebulun as it has been uh, counted. That is, the number of the tribe of Ze Zebulun needs to be stretched out in its its number. That's another way you could translate this. Right? No translator would translate it that that way because they wouldn't think of it that way. But you could easily translate the phrase that way. Okay. So we have Ephraim, a root of Ephraim against Amalek. After thee, Benjamin, among thy people, out of Machir came down governors, and out of Zebulun, them that handle the pen of the writer. Now, why is Machir something that's being referenced? Well, that's that's uh, Manasseh, and that's okay. on um, the east or, or the western side of the Jordan. Okay, so we have the sons of Raquel. And then we have Zebulun. Now, wasn't he the final son of Leah? Um, let me see. Um, yeah, he's the final son of Leah. So what we have here then is we have Raquel's sons and the final son of Leah. So are these representative of our time? And well, the youngest too, right? So in, in the sense that of all the 12 tribes, they're the three youngest is Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin, the last three born. Okay. All right, Joseph being divided into Manasseh here and Ephraim, but... Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin, the last three. Are these four being, are, are they some type of a figurative reference to a message? Well, I would think so. I mean, we've already had the story of Joseph in that context. But, you know, we usually think of Joseph and then we have, uh, you know, Benjamin, of course, is part of that story. But Zebulun here, um, you know, the question is, why is Zebulun mentioned? Other than that, we've been able to apply Zebulun uh, to the, the, it was the first one we used to count the tribes. So 
you know, 57,400 days from May 23rd, 1863 to July 18, 2020. Um, but we also have these symbols here, uh, you know, my second oldest son, his name's Joseph Benjamin. Um, Joseph means let him add, and Benjamin, son of the right hand. Um, so, you know, to me, this is kind of symbolizing enumeration as well, as well, right? Okay. And Joseph means to actually stretch out or lengthen or prolong or extend, right? So it's the same sort of idea that we're dealing with in this verse. Okay. Now in Judges 5.15, and the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar and also Barak. He was sent on foot into the valley for the divisions of Reuben. There were great thoughts of the heart. Okay. So let's just go back to the other verse. Good. Okay. In the notes they're just dealing with uh, uh, May 14th. Right. Um, so just a note from uh, Stephen's birth. It's 18720 days. I think I'm correct. I could be wrong. But to May 14th, uh, 20, uh, 2020. Is that correct, Stephen? Yes. Yeah, so 18,720 days from the day Stephen was born to St. Corona Day in 2020, which was May 14th. And that's the day they originally were going to have this meeting between all the different uh, uh, people with the Pope, different nations and leaders and so forth, which never transpired because of the pandemic. So I think it's kind of interesting here. Yeah, I think it was um, so 187 days after November 9th, right. and then 65 days before July 18th. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. Um, yeah, so, so it was this interesting date that never happened, which should have given us an indication that July 18th wasn't going to occur, as we expected. Yeah, we, had, we had lined up them 777 days with the 777 years of Lamech. Yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was kind of like, uh, or, or like a mirror image. So you had 187 days prior to that, you had uh, the birth of Methuselah. And so then it was, it was just like mirroring that. So then 187 days afterwards, you'd have uh, that sort of November 9th in the, in the middle. Yeah. Okay, so just to uh, show you here what Stephen, can I, I'll share the screen. Okay, just a second. There you go. Yeah, I have a couple of other things on here, but um, so you can see from November 9th, 2019, there's a 252 days, and that's 187 days and 65 days, and there you have St. Corona Day, May 14th, 2020. So that happens to be 18,720 days from Stephen's birthday, but also 187 days from November 9th. So this is an important part of this structure of the 777 days that begin on November 9th. Now, um, so, so when you have Enoch and then, how, how's it go again, Stephen, with the, the ages that they, who has who, when? Enoch's born, and then 65 years later, Methuselah is born. And then Methuselah is 187, 
when he has Lamech. Lamech. Okay. So so it's kind of a reverse of that. Yes. Okay. So if it's a reverse, then if we go back from November 9th, 2019, we come to September 23rd, 2017, when I first present July 18th as a symbol of the prediction before midnight. Right? Yep. Mm-hmm. So, so that would just be another confirmation of the September 23rd date in 2017 as part of the structure. And, and there's no reason why we can't go backwards, especially since these are already uh, backwards, right? Okay, thanks, Stephen and Angela. That's going to be helpful. Okay, you can share yours again, Dwight. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to draw that out. But that's very interesting. Okay. <clears throat> Why is it, what, what symbol can we see of the princes of Issachar being with Deborah? And why in the Hebrew is it saying, and the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar? Okay, so so part of the problem here. So we know that uh, you had um, Zebulun and Naphtali are the ones that are going to come against uh, Sisera, right? Right. But they're going to mention here, uh, you know, Ephraim, Benjamin and Manasseh on the west side of the Jordan. Okay. Um, so it just says there was a root of them that came of them of Amalek, that is people in the ter- territory of Amalek, that is of the tribe of Re- Ephraim. But you don't hear about this in Judges chapter four, do we? That these people joined in somewhat in this battle, or is that what it's saying? It's just I saying. Don't know, was, I don't know that Judges four approaches that. What's that? I said I don't know that Judges four approaches that. Yeah, I, I don't think it does, but it's mentioned here in Judges five. So I, I'm not sure what that means. That it's not mentioned in Judges four, but it's here mentioned in Judges five, and definitely is in this very symbolic way. Um. So. I find it fascinating, but um, but it's just yeah we have something here that's mentioned that's not really um, it's not really anywhere else that we can see this. Okay. Okay, the point that, that Stephen makes here, First Chronicles 12.32 in the chat. And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Okay, so Issachar is referencing in a symbolic way those that have understanding of the times. Okay. So that is interesting so that comparison is when we're looking at this with the princes of issachar are those the those that are the chronologists well it's just you know the word here is just the word prince sar so it wouldn't generally mean that but in the context of issachar and how we're looking at it symbolically um that there are the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. So this is a reference to the spirit of prophecy. So this is in accordance with what 
uh, God has revealed as far as the methods of study. Okay. And um, now the idea of recom uh, of Issachar is recompense, right? Um, there is recompense is what it means. So what is recompense? Payment for services? Well, well, it's to pay somebody back for something, but I mean just symbolically. Okay. But I'm what I'm looking at with this, with the princes of Issachar, in in the way that this is being addressed, is aren't these the men of Issachar? The princes of Issachar, aren't these standing with what Mrs. White has had to say? If we are making the application of Deborah mm -hmm. being the, the spiritual equivalent of Mrs. White. Yeah, of the spirit of prophecy. Yeah. Okay, the spirit of prophecy. Not the person. Yeah, okay. So, um Well, this definitely applies. So they're going to mention these different groups that, that weren't involved, but they are involved symbolically. Because really, it's just Zebulun, right? And Issachar. I guess Issachar is involved. So these are two. So the princes of Issachar. And... Uh, no, it's Zebulun and Naphtali that are the that you get the ten thousand, right? Right. So Issachar, Benjamin, Manasseh, and Ephraim aren't actually involved in the account in Judges chapter four, but they are mentioned here in chapter five, and just some of them, right? Not right. all. Of them. Um, that is a select group out of these. And even when it comes to Manasseh, it's just Macher, those that are on the west side of the Jordan, is the idea, that of, because of their location. So they're not they're not the ones in Gilead and and Bashan and that area. Okay. And then the symbolic nature of Joseph as it applies to our lines. And then what about Ephraim? There was a root of them against Amalek. Now, this is talking about this that took over that area that was Amalek. <clears throat> had. Right. Um, but what would Ephraim be referring to here? I mean, it means double fruit. So is that sort of a doubling, the midnight cry? Good possibility. Is it the midnight cry or is this with the double the double fruit giving a spiritual reference to the fact that the message has to be given two times? Mm, I don't know. Now, why in this portion is Barak sent on his feet into the valley? What do we see when, when a soldier or a, a messenger is sent on their feet? If we look at this in the past, uh, when that which had been a prophet chose to seek money to curse Israel, he didn't go by foot. He rode on the ass. 
So his, his message was being brought through Islam. What can we see about this with Barak and his message when he is sent by foot? Is this a more personal message? Well, at this point, there's too much. <laughs> no, I know there's there's a lot here. So we are we are coming to the end of our time together today. There's a lot for us here to consider. Yeah, and and see, I'm looking still at these tribes and these numbers, right? Right. Ephraim, Benjamin, Manasseh, Zebulun, Issachar. Um, and, and I've addressed these numbers in, in different places. I haven't put them all together yet. Well, should we return to this on the tribes and their numbers and Judges 514? Shall we return to this on Sunday? Yeah, I'll try to get some more of this put together um, so people can see it. But uh, to me, it's pretty clear that this is... Um, I mean, there's just too many things that fit with what we're studying here. Okay. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments at this moment? Okay, shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to meet together, to study together, to rightly divide your word, the word of truth. Help us now, Father. May that which we do bring glory to your name. May our characters begin to reflect your character more and more so that we may truly give a message to this world at this time in earth's history so that this message may go out with the power that you have intended for it to go i thank you for each one that has participated today i thank you for those that will view this later be with us now Direct us in all things that we do. May your will be done. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.